You can you can keep your microphones on, boys, if you want. Can you see an orange screen? Full orange screen? Yeah. yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, this one is obviously called what what you should be coaching and how you should be coaching it. So basically, this week and next week are going to be very much about football, X's and O's, and the way we actually coach, right? So in the coming weeks, we'll branch out into different things. But this is definitely very much a football, a football discussion and... It will go into next week probably more about how we actually deliver it. So I, I sort of figure that, that they're the two most important things. Any coach who starts starts coaching or gets into coaching has to has to get across first. I think I I, sh I think you guys have got my contact details, but if you haven't, um please just let me know. Um one of the, one of the biggest mistakes I see coaches and players try and do. I believe there's a player in the um, junior reps this week has done a racial slur, for example, or an alleged racial, racial slur. And that just shows you how much people try and copy what they've seen or heard in the NRL, right? And it, it's very common. I remember when I was a kid, I wanted to be a goalkeeper for Manchester City. And um, Andy Dibble, the City goalie, did a bit of a foul once on someone and got sent off. And I tried to emulate it the week after when I was playing myself. And players try and emulate. I mean, one thing you'll have seen on the on the training field a million times is people trying to do the Benji Marshall step, for example. Um, players who aren't capable of doing it but think they can do it. Um, but coaches do as well. And I always say to players and coaches that remember... The NRL players train more than our community teams do in a week or sometimes a month in one day. So we, it's not an apple and an apple situation. Another thing that's very different is all their players turn up to every training session. Uh, Bill, do all yours turn up to all yours? And Jason, do all yours turn up to all yours? No, certainly not. Yeah. What about you, Bill? Uh, not previously. Uh, this yep. year, though, we're getting about 90% buy-in, so yeah, it's good. pretty good. Good, good. And then, again, that will be that will get in, um, interrupted by things throughout the year, school events and family events, and also if you don't play too well and they're not enjoying it all the time at the weekend, then that might impact that too. So you, it's a constant evolving thing. Um. Also, NRL players don't go to school or work before they train. So uh, you talk to any player in the NRL in particular who used to be a part-time footballer or you talk to the retired footballers from years ago, how hard it was to do what they were asked to do at training each night when they were at a day of work, especially if they were on the tools. And even some kids are subjected to quite a lot of physical activity in school, either through choice or through an element of persuasion, because they play an awful lot of games in the playground at break time. So you've got to sort of figure that into some of the things that you do as well sometimes. Um, I, I, I've no doubt you guys will have heard me say this before about the way players retreat in defence. In the NRL, they tend to backpedal. Or when they get tired, they'll turn round, and then and then you see uh, um, community players try and try and emulate that, and then wonder why they they get tired early in games. So I always advocate turning round, not backpedaling in defence to preserve energy in the community game. Um, wrestling tactics. So the the quality of wrestling tactics in a lot of NRL clubs, Manly seem to have gone back to just hitting and tackling as hard as they can whereas Roosters are still, uh, and the commentary referred to it today too, just cajoling the player to the ground and manipulating them to the ground and trying to control them. Uh, to be honest, some of your players, and again, Jason and Bill, I'd love to tell me tell me what you what your team is like. Some of them, you'll be hard-pressed still to get them to make a tackle, won't you, sometimes? Yeah, I've got guys that haven't even played before, so in under 14, so mm -hmm. I'll have me uh, work cut out. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Bill? Yeah, my under twelves. I've uh, got five new players this year, and a lot of yeah. them are just trying to do arm tackles. Just reach out and grab them, and 
not working, but there's no wrestling, that's for sure. Yeah. Now, when we get to the defensive part of today, please talk to me about your team and, and, we, and the players and tackling and things like that and what position they're in or roughly what area of the field they'll be defending in because I'll be able to help with that tonight, hopefully for you. Um, <clears throat> another big one I see is the hooker role. Have you noticed hookers have started rolling out at dummy half ever since Cameron Smith did it? Have you noticed that? So yeah. they like to creep out at dummy half, both left and right of the rook. Now, again, if you think about the NRL and compare it to community rugby league, the referee has certain considerations about how long players can be lay on for in the rook and things like that, how long they can be held down for. And also the referees tend to be quite consistent with the rook week on week on week. Definitely at 14s. Yes, at 12s, but definitely at 14s. The the referee interpretation of the rook each week will be very different, won't it, Jason? Like it'll be sometimes seem like a different sport. Yeah. Yeah, and they all play different here. Like it's all pretty much off the deck. They don't sort of get out too much. Yeah, okay. What about your guys, Bill? Do they try and roll out a bit because they try and copy it off the telly? Um, oh, my son plays dummy half for like there half every game because they got to swap bibs at half time. But um, yeah. he likes to try and be a bit creative. <laughs> he um, now, watches what... watches games pretty closely and likes to try and emulate. So, yeah. what The reason I mentioned the rook and the refereeing is because rolling out in the rook is very um, dependent on the quality of play the ball that you get and the the speed of the play the ball you get. And that's why I talked about the consistency of the refereeing. So um, also what happens is most players are roughly a similar size, aren't they, in the NRL? You, you don't have one huge team that dwarfs everyone else like you do in junior football sometimes. And, and therefore, there tends to be an element of consistency each week. You see roughly the same thing around the rook, the same, the same kind of tactics and tackles and play the ball speeds. In your age groups, one week you'll be playing against a team twice the size of you. The next week you'll be playing against a team with a mix and match. The week after you might be playing against a team half the size of you. And throw in a different referee each time as well and you could have different interpretations. And the reason I keep going back to the rook and talking about the hooker is because if if when you roll out, you need to have a dominant rook, basically. You need to have a fast play the ball so you can roll out and maximise that space. And one of the big things I see so many young hookers try and do is roll out when they've not got the rook to do that. And the other thing is you need your forwards to be instinctive with the dummy half. So I used to play prop and I used to love a prop, just a hooker just giving me the ball straight off the deck so I could time my run off that. Because what you don't want is to be worrying about when you're catching the ball, when you're a prop. You want to catch the ball and run as hard as you can north don't you so the, it's a very long explanation for for what my advice is here i tell all my hookers that i coach start with the two g's give or go no in between and then when they've built up the combinations over time and when they've started to learn rook recognition then they can start thinking about probing a little bit more does that make sense boys so um Without seeing the footage of your son, Bill, I can't really comment on whether what he's doing is creative or not, if that makes sense. It's um, it, it's, it's hard to say un, un, unless I see it. Does that all make sense? Yeah, totally. Um, he's usually big on service to the to the um, first receiver because we're still playing the bibs and two pass yeah, rule. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but when he sees the right thing, he he'll step out and yeah, good. they can go. So yeah, yeah, he, yeah, he gets good. it. He's got to make a decision very quickly and do one or the other. So good, good. Um, the other one is set plays. How many set plays do you have with your teams, boys? If any, um, we're only going to have probably two. Max, I yeah. think, is about yeah. all my boys will be able to handle at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. What about you, Bill? I'm not doing uh, any We all, will or... have some this year, but we're not there yet. We're still working yeah, okay. on that because we've got yeah. so many new kids. So, 
Yeah, we're yeah, still yeah. like filling out positions and stuff. We've been a bit fluid with who plays where and stuff like that in the past. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, we're just setting up for competition next year. And then the other thing is, if you're coaching players for the long term and not just the short term, as in winning this week or winning the competition, then you've got to get that balance really right. So Jason, I'd say he'd probably stay at around two because set plays are literally robotic, aren't they? Unless yeah. there's two or three options within that set play, uh, then it becomes a shape rather than a set play, if that makes sense. So um, just just be very cautious of it, Bill, because um, you don't want to stifle the creativity of your players either. You know, the um, I, I see so many teams in the NRL where I think that they are told they're they're they're, they're creative genius is stifled by a coach who puts too much structure on them. So it's something that we have to be really, really cautious of. If your players aren't that skillful, if your players are, if they need, if if you need to get some points out of them somehow or, or develop goal forward in them somehow, because they've not got the ability to do it. I always say to coaches, then you put in some set plays to, to break down the defense. If at any point this, anything doesn't make sense, just, just let me know, boys. Okay. Um, your jobs as you, as you, as a coach, to get your team fit and fitter, skilled combinations and game tactics, um, to keep them safe. So your warm ups, your cool downs, and hydration, etc. Can while while I've got the, just a couple of you here, but bear in mind we're going to have other people who get the recording. Can you sort of tell me a little bit about yourselves as coaches, where you are? where you are in these four categories, if you like. So I'll start with you, Bill, if that's okay. Um, so if you sort of look, you know, how, how much time do you spend getting your players fit or fitter? Or do you, do, you, do you try and put it in into everything and skills and combinations and whatnot? If you could sort of give me an idea of, of where you fit on these. Uh, yeah, we do about five to ten minutes at the start of the session, just um, mm-hmm. like stretches and jobs mm-hmm. and stuff like that mm-hmm. um then we work on well this year we've worked on like our attacking structure mainly mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. getting the guys into that and rotating different people through it so they can adapt on the field mm-hmm. uh, combinations we worked on different halves and because we got the bibs it's we kind of got to have multiple people that can do the same role yeah uh, tactics wise, just keep working to the open side as much as we can. Uh, warm up, cool down, all that sort of stuff. Like we, my wife's a manager. She's put out a very detailed list of what they're supposed to do before training. Yeah, okay. Herself. Like she, she really do they do it? Do they do it? Pretty much everybody. There's one or two that turn up energy drinks or KFC or something like that. <laughs> I think that that's that's um, that would have been me. Food. I think. Yeah. Um, but for the most part, especially this year in under 12s, like we've had a really good buy-in from all the kids. So good, pretty happy with that. Good, good, good. What about you, Jason, in those categories? Uh, probably the fit and fitter. Um, I, I like to play like a lot of games um, mm. with, with the boys, get them. You know, like we, in the past, we've had lots of coaches that are just like run, run, run. Like our 16s this year, they've, they've been training for probably – four or five weeks and they've only just started to touch the ball now. So they've just been yeah. having the guts run out of them, you'd say. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I like to play a lot of games. Um, yeah. Skill wise, we've been really working on our, our passing cause that's that some of the boys are really lacking in their passing skills mm-hmm. um, and just some defensive skills and combinations and tactics. We haven't really worked on any of that just yet, but I'm starting to notice from the games that a few combinations are starting to develop with um a few boys, so yeah, which has been good. Yeah. Um and yeah, keep them safe. We've got our warm up, little cool down, and we've got our hydration there as well for them. So yeah. So yeah, um, but last couple of weeks I've been um last couple of sessions I've been using a couple of your sessions from um get them fit without flogging. Oh them, yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. And how are they all feeling? Yeah, good. They really enjoyed that a lot. Yeah, good. So, which yeah. has been good. I've had hundred percent good feedback from people who've done that. It's yeah. um, and you'll be you'll be hitting your numbers. You'll be hitting your numbers, Jason, if you've done it properly. You'll be getting the you'll be getting them fit and fitter, 
you'll be getting them skilled. You'll be building up combinations and strategies without even knowing it because the players will be doing them in the games themselves. Um, there was a period when I was at Ippy High, I used to let the players have an hour a week where they could create their own little things. And I gave them. I said they're allowed one. They're allowed one set move near the try line that they create themselves, and I don't want to know about it. And because players can do that, and players of fourteen will be able to do that definitely. Players of twelve will bill as well. There'll be a couple of them that have got good football IQ that that will be able to just come up with little things. You know, the the prop might be saying to his the fullback might be saying to the prop. You know, um, when you when you when you run and try and get out on your right side and just offload to me. I'll come through, you know, something like that. Players do do that kind of thing all the time. So when you do play games in training, you just bring that, you bring that forward faster, if that makes sense. So, um, and of course, the other things on top of all these jobs are things like the psychology of the team, team selections, et cetera, et cetera. But this is, this is a very basic overview of the kind of things that we'll, that we're going to go into in this in this um and then while i've got you both i'll ask you what stage of 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 coach you you think you are so i've the, the top two are highlighted in the x's and o's and drills focused and heavily learning content i've highlighted those two because that's basically the theme of of this of this and next week's webinar um and then there's the but i think i also think that's a coaching stage depending on how long you've been coaching for um, you, you sort of learn and you still, you, first of all, you go, I need some drills, I need some activities. And then you go, right, now what have I actually got to do to in those activities? Um, and then when you've done that, you look for new ways to deliver content. And that's why I think people come on things like, like seminars and, and go on websites and things like that. And then you'll get to a stage as a coach where your content in your rugby league knowledge, um, you, obviously you, you evolve and tweak it each year, but you start to look at the way you deliver messages. And then there's another one at the bottom that I call, I haven't got a fucking clue what stage I'm at stage. So what what, what stage would you boys say you were at? If that was listed one to five, where would you put yourself, Bill? Uh, I reckon I'm probably about a two. Like, okay. I feel like I know how to coach. I just feel like I know I need to know what to coach, if that makes sense. Yeah. Well, you're probably, you're probably a mixture of two and three then. Yeah, yeah. What about you, Jason? Um, yeah, I'm probably I'm probably the same. I've been coaching for a fair while now, but um, mm. I'm always looking for uh, looking for new ways to do things, I guess. Um, yeah. I was unlucky as a player. I didn't really have any decent coaches when I was when I was playing. So mm. everything I've learnt has been has been through. Um, watching stuff on the internet, watching all your stuff. So yeah, I've yeah, got yeah. a lot out of that. Yeah, it's funny, isn't it? The sometimes you don't get your best coaching as well. I, I, I had I had great coaches that I loved playing for, um, and uh, I guess I was lucky in the sense that the coaches weren't fathers of any players in the team back when I played. But they brought different things out of me as a player. But the best technical coaches I didn't get until I was 18 and 19. And I was playing in rep teams. And I wish I'd have got some of those at the age 13 and 40. And so I think uh, what's really interesting whenever I show this slide to anyone, that we have got a, a culture now of coaches that tend to be learners. And they're very conscious of where they are at as coaches, which is really good. Whereas... Uh, only occasionally I, I speak to coaches who say I don't need to learn anything, you know, because we all, we literally all need to learn all the time, don't we? So no, that's good. Um, tell me this, Bill, you had a, you said you had a difficult weekend football wise this weekend. Um, did the boys lose? Uh, boys and girls at this age. Um, yeah, yeah, they lost not, not by a lot, but they just, Everything we taught at training, they left behind when they got in the field. Okay. It's one of those weekends. It is what it is. Um, we've got two rounds and then we've got a three-week break. So I said, treat these like trial games like you're watching on TV. Nice. And then we'll have a three-week break, talk about it, work it out, and then we'll start our season on round three. 
And then what what about you, Jason? Where are you at with your players season wise? I uh, see we don't start till um, early May, so I've still got quite a bit of time with my boys yet. So <laughs> you could start pre season this week then. <laughs> yeah, well, we've we've already we've been training for a while now, so a few weeks. So in the played any trials? Been... No, no, we don't really play any trials out here. So yeah, okay, no, nah. yeah, all right. So you've got plenty of time to to get them right. So again, yeah, I do. S- tell tell me, Bill. I'm putting you on the spot here a little bit, mate. Sorry, but how did you react to? And how's how how will you be reacting to what happened this weekend? Um, well, we do the we have like a little what we call deadly devil. That's the not player of the match, but just the encouragement award sort of yeah. thing we do. Yeah. Um, and before that, we do a little spiel about how the game went. We said, well, you know, we didn't play our best, but there were I highlighted the things we did well, mm-hmm. and I talked a little bit about things we didn't do quite as well. But I didn't make it about a like you know witch hunt about who didn't do this and who didn't do that. So yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, it's just here's the things that we're probably going to look at and we're going to work at next training session. So yeah, okay. How do you think your players will feel? Um, I try and encourage them to keep improving. That's that's my, I know, like quite a few coaching philosophy is continuous improvement. Like mm-hmm. we take what they're doing and we go, okay, how do we? dial it up one notch mm-hmm. how do we like pick the things they're not doing well and just start picking those up mm-hmm. and how do we reward the things they're doing well so um yeah we'll we'll have a talk about it at the start of training about what we've done well what we haven't done well and the drills will reflect a lot of that so okay what will the team be like do you think if they lose the next two or three times they play as well uh, that's pretty much how our last season started, and we okay. finished very strong. So, and and they don't. Uh, are you saying to me they st- they tend to be a bit not oblivious, but they're a bit neutral in their reactions to these things, or do they? Oh, they don't like it. Yeah, definitely don't like it. But yeah, we it's don't not, focus on the negative. Fatal. We focus yeah, good, on yeah. what we can fix. So basically, if your team are staying together and the and the they are used to losing and winning games, then I would argue that you've nailed this already. In terms of win, lose, or draw, you are you are developing. And... We're still non-competitive at this this year. My goal yeah. is by the end of this year that they're ready to step in a competitive next year with. And they know though, don't the they? right skills and the right mindset. They so... know though, even though it's supposedly non-competitive, they're still. Oh, we've known the score yeah. since under sixes, mate. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, um, and. I'm pretty sure I've spoken about this with you guys before. The key is just the, the key is just managing mentality and emotions. I remember when I first came over to Australia and um, ended up at Manly Seagulls for my first year here in 07, I was assisting a coach in, with the SG ball and I'd only arrived literally two weeks before the season. So I was a, a late ringing and basically what I observed was a coach who allowed the results to determine his mentality and the, therefore the team's mentality. So that by round six, the fact that they weren't going to make the finals really brought the, the the emotions of the team right down because of how it wasn't managed. Does that make sense? And I, I was on, I was only a young coach then and, and I picked it up straight away that – there, there was no sort of clear from this coach. There was no clear direction of where they were heading. There was no, don't worry. All we need to do is add this and add this, or get better at this and get better at that, and it will come good. And it, that was never really communicated to the players. I had my own chance the year after because I ended up taking the team. And we were north from three. <laughs> and <laughs> I remember feeling, because, you know, obviously at an NRL club too, there's a lot of pressure around you because there's about five people queuing up to take your job. And I remember applying what I thought should have happened the year before to that scenario. And it was the first time I'd really been in that situation as a young coach. And it was 17 years ago, so... It was a long time ago. And we ended up, I think we went on a 
a huge run for the next year and a half. And it was about me being really clear on where we were headed. And there was all those building block blocks in place, but we just had to put the final blocks in and, and tidy up a few things. And then it was going to turn around and, and it emphatically did, you know, it was, it was literally the next game where it turned around emphatically. We won a game by 60 points and, and never looked back. And I think we lost two or three games in the next year and a half, and that was it. And I I honestly believe that that was a formation of how I approached every coaching challenge ever after that. It's that wherever you go, you're on a journey, right? Whatever happens this weekend, just gone, or next weekend, you're on a journey. And what you've just got to try and do is make sure you're heading north on the journey all the time. And sometimes a scoreboard can tell you something that doesn't make you feel like you're in the right direction. You're going in the right direction. And I guess that's the theory behind these non-competitive games. But you know as a coach, Bill, don't you, if you're headed in the right direction, regardless of what happened on the scoreboard or didn't happen because it's non-competitive, you know? You know, don't yeah. you? And you know, Jason, you know if you're headed in the right in the right direction. And, yep. and that, yeah. Well, and that think... is... Sorry. No, you're all right. I think sometimes you got to make the coaching fit the kids and not the kids fit the coaching. That's right. That's right. I like that. Yeah. Do you, do, did what I say with you resonate with you then, Jason, in terms of, I know maybe you probably don't get as much pressure uh, as maybe I was under then, but I bet you put pressure on yourself or, or your players feel a bit of pressure if they don't win a few games. Yeah, they do. The kids definitely feel it, but um, I don't know. I just try to keep things positive and, and um, like okay, like losing the part of the game, and and it'll bring them down for sure. But you just got to try and keep them pumped up and and get them yeah. ready for next week. So yeah, sometimes the best thing you can do is just play another game. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, get it out of the system. Um, now this next slide. And this is for everybody who listened to the recording and yourselves, boys. Try and get into this habit of planning your training, doing it, and then reviewing it, or planning your week and doing it, reviewing it. How good are you both at planning your training? Not as good yeah, as I should be. <laughs> what about you, Bill? Um, yeah, I, I've, I've learnt because I'm like get anxiety bad so i've learned i've got to have it all planned down to the minute yeah okay and i do that and i've got backup plans in case things don't go the way they should if only four kids turn up i've got a plan for that so yeah 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 um i do that and that's work for club and school kids and all that sort of yeah, stuff good. so always got something and now that i've done that last year i've got a whole book full of stuff that if something goes wrong this year i can refer back to it that's right. Perfect. What, so, Jason, you say not as much as you should do. Can you? What does that look like? Well, I've always got I've always got it written down and planned what I'm what I'm going to plan to do. But um, it I, I should be sitting down and doing probably the next three or four sessions in advance. So I think it's sort mm -hmm. of a, a a thing that I'll do the um the day before we train. Mm. I. Uh, you're probably more advanced than so many coaches out there, though, the fact that you do that. And I, I reckon think, just one week ahead. Yeah. And I think I think your time to sit down and really plan for weeks ahead is your pre-season, really, so you've got a, um, a map of where you're going. But very soon, what happens at weekend is going to be dictating how, how, what you need to fix each week. So don't put too much pressure on yourself to um, plan weeks and weeks ahead now, Jason, I wouldn't think. I think, you know, a week ahead or it is definitely like like Bill said, a good idea. Yeah. The other thing with, with, with planning and doing reviewing is we tend to stay in our own minds a little bit and sometimes we'll just plan what's comfortable for us to plan and blah, blah, blah. Actually review sometimes if what you're doing is the best thing that you can do in that circumstance. So I think what happens is, and you'll see this with these seminars, if you turn up to every seminar this week, right, 
this this year that we do on a Sunday, you'll see in pre-season, you see a load of coaches jump on. And then you'll see during the season, it's the really committed coaches that come on. Because people get washed up in the in the whirlpool of the season. And they get washed up in the whirlpool of the of the of life and family. And they actually just go, it's like they're on a treadmill. They're just going on a treadmill, going on a treadmill, and then at the end of the season, they get off the treadmill for a bit start reflecting on coaching and then try and be a better coach the year after. If you can try and intercept this treadmill journey each week, and it sounds to me, Bill, like you really do this. And Jason, it sounds to me like you somewhat do this, where you go, plan it, you know, you're planning at least. How good are you both at reviewing and, and, and are you critical of yourself or or do you get do you ask people's opinions and things like that? I'll usually um at the end of the session I'll I'll um think, oh yeah, no, this worked, this didn't work. Yeah. Um and then and go from there. So yeah, pretty yeah. Yeah, I just just review it myself and yeah. I I and it's easy to tell if the boys are buying into it or they're not quite into the drill. Um, yeah. So yeah, so then I'll switch things up a bit. And I think I think one of the biggest indicators of a good training session is if your players enjoyed it and if they had fun. And a fun a, a team that's having fun is happy. <laughs> you know, like yeah. fun, fun is a is a is a cause of happiness. So. Um, if you can really factor that into your coachings and, but yeah, again, hopefully you understand what I'm trying to say. Just try and get off that treadmill for an hour or two a week and just think, right, rather than just doing a session, why am I doing this session? What, what am I doing this session for or this week for? And how can I make it better? If you just spend, I don't know, it might be 30 minutes a week, um, plan and do review 20 years ago when I got in this habit, I, don't get me wrong, it gave me some mental torture because I was never happy with myself. But, uh, <laughs> you know, it, it's a really good habit to get into because that's how you improve as a coach. And I think the fact that you're here on a Sunday night is another thing to um, to suggest that you, you're in that mode too. And I think we've covered that a little bit already, the first one. What do you guys do with players who miss training? Uh, how do you cater for it? As in... How does that impact your training? Oh, mine doesn't. And it doesn't impact too much at the moment because okay. um, where where I'm coaching and the club I'm coaching with, um, we've got a lot of um, boarders that are that are part of the school there. And, oh um, yeah. If they're getting into strife and they're getting grounded, well then they're not coming to train, and the school will mm-hmm. keep them up there. So, um, mm-hmm. but at the moment, it's not impacting me too much. So. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, what about you, Bill? Does it you've you've said you've already said, haven't you? You plan for ten players or twenty players or four. How how different do those sessions look? Uh yeah, very different. Um, okay. In previous years, we had a lot of kids that missed training, and then they'd be begging to be half back or dummy half or whatever, and it'd be like, yeah, it's not happening, mate. Like, if you train the position at training, you can do it on game day. Got you. Otherwise. Yeah. 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 Obviously, because not just because they don't know what we're doing, but it's also as not a punishment, but we don't want to reward kids that are doing the wrong thing. Yeah. You need to make sure training is important or else nobody would do it and just turn yeah. up at the weekend. Oh, yeah. That's it. We got kids that what work their ass off all year long and they don't necessarily want to be in a bib, but they work their ass off all year long. They watch some kids swan in from doing no training and chuck a bib on and throw the ball around and score three tries. Nothing worse for team morale. Nothing yeah. worse for team morale. So when we talk some football now, I'm going to constantly be pulling it back to the really simple way of coaching it, right? So um, especially when we talk about line shots, when we talk about the ball shifting from right to left, I'll break it down in such a way that you'll think you could teach three-year-old how to do it. Right, so that's that's the goal of of this football talk now. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, 
let's keep putting it into context for your team. I hope you don't mind, but I want to continue to ask questions of you and your and your coaching environments because it can allow me because there's only a two of you here live now, it can allow us to have a really specific conversation about your training and it will help all those that are, that are watching the recording after as well. Um, and we'll come up with some practical solutions. So when it comes to coaching passing, uh, there's actually about 16 points about catching and passing the football that you that you would get in a normal coaching manual. Have, have, have you both seen something like this before? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, in defence, have you both seen something like this before? No. Yeah, I have, yes. Okay. All right. So, would you both agree with me that both those, both those slides are quite wordy? Like this? Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Because if I if I put that out for ten seconds and said right, then I took it off and then said right, repeat everything to me that you you remember, <laughs> uh, th- right? And and this is this is where we get it wrong as coaches. Sometimes we speak like this to players and wonder why they can't carry out instructions, why they look frozen when we fill the head with all these instructions. That there is just passing, catching and passing a football. Now. let's use the example of the ball coming to you. Do you think you have time to think about 16 different things <laughs> in that time when the ball's coming to you and you're about to pass it again? And the same with defence. You know, you need to really simplify the coaching me- message and and that's what I'll be going through, going through today. In terms of what to coach, have a look at this, guys, and tell me, is there anything much outside of this that you coach? So, Core unit and team. So core is the individual carrying out skills, so core skills. The unit is your left side, your middle, your right, or your forwards and your backs, or a group of people that are in that are working on something together. Game plan stuff, obviously. Um under that, rook control, grip pass, catch, carry, play the ball, kick and chase, lines and run for core and unit skills in offense. And core core and unit skills in defense, tackle technique, rook control, line discipline. Is there anything major you think I've missed there that you cover in your training? Or is that a nice broad brush to, to cover both both your training environments? No, that's good. Yeah? Yeah, it's good. Yeah, okay. All right. I'll go to the exciting stuff first. We'll talk game plan, right? So as we go down this, we'll go down and then we'll go grip, pass, catch, carry, and stuff like that, and and tackle tech later. So, to, uh, cross fingers, this hopefully will work. Um, and I'll need to share a new screen. Number. Can you still see the orange screen? Yep. Yep. Can you now see the website? Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. Let me, I'm just going to move it. And can you still see the website? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Um, this will get a little bit, sometimes I might click on something and then you won't be able to, to see the new screen. Can you see a diagram now? Yeah, play through set. Yep. Perfect. Okay. If I didn't explain that to you, explain that to me. Tell me what you think you see. Yeah, tacking through the middle there and play one. Right. Um, yeah, I've always, I've always found these a little bit confusing. Okay. Bill? So you're trying to play the open side and bring the forwards into it? Mm. Yep. Um, if I show it in context with this one, that's the second play on the set. How, how would you describe that set? If that was, I don't know, let's say tackle two, 
and that was tackle three. How would you describe the the direction of the set? Trying to um, uh, trying to hold up your defenders through the middle there, and then um, shifting out to the open, and hopefully find a bit of space out there. Okay. What about you, Bill? Like five on three or something like that. Okay. It's funny. (laughs) It's actually the opposite. I'm actually trying to work that I'm actually trying to work them laterally across the field. Right. So I'm in this set, we're trying to work the opposition laterally across the field. So, and this is again, this is an important coaching message. Um everybody everybody learns and sees things in a different way, right? In a minute, I'm gonna show you the video of this and you go, Oh yeah, that's what it is, right? But basically it's important to show you the diagram because because just one sec, I just somebody's just messaged me about that. Um because this set, once you get this set right, it will it will make sense to all for, for all the other sets to do, right? So the numbers represent somebody on, on the field, right? So number seven, half back. Okay. Do you both agree with me? Your props tend to be in the middle, your lock tends to be in the middle, your full back can go wherever they want, but considering the balls around here, they'll probably go in the middle. Yes. Yeah. Um, so that's our point, our point of of um attack around here. Do you agree with me that the seven with this many people around him or her? can actually do whatever they want in that area. So they could do catch and pass. They could do catch face ball. They could do a catch block. They could do a a dummy outside, throw the ball inside. Um, Do you agree that everything's possible within that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, The server's got plenty of options. That's right. That's right. So... What the story of this of this is trying to tell you is that the team has field balance. They're spread across the width of the field. The, the defenders, because the attack is spread across the width of the field, the defenders react to that, and it opens them up a little bit more. And the first play goes and hits these, around about these three or four defenders here, Right. And then everyone just stays in shape. So nobody comes out of shape. So no, so if you imagine six has got a tram line, 12's got a tram line, four's got a tram line. They've all got tram lines. They all stay in their own tram lines. And then in the next play, the six does the same thing there. And he can do the same thing with his four. Can you see that? Yep. Right? So this is designed to wrap, wrap across the field. So... Now we'll look at the words. So I've I've given you a visual or a type of visual, um, and I call I, I've I've just called it a playthrough set, but you know you could call it you could call it um you could call it a whatever you wanted, right? That I, I just call it playthrough set, um, just so you can tag on your own name. It can be used as an attacking set or as an exit set. So you can do it coming out of your own half or the middle of the field, or you can actually do it as a, as a point of attack. It's ideal against spread defences and big players. So I can almost guarantee, without seeing your teams play and who they play against, very rarely do you come up against a real compressed defence. Yeah. That'd very be right? Rarely. Yes. You're right? Yeah. Um, so all your defences are going to be quite spread. Um, this kind of set as well is very good for moving big players sideways. I don't know if either of you have ever played prop or how big you both are, but I'm I was a prop. I'm a big fella. I hated moving sideways. <laughs> I wanna I wanna go in straight lines, right? This kind of set does that and it exposes poor defenders. It works them over, and then you've got the option the option of attacking back at them with a plus one or a plus two. You should look for defenders who jump out or hang back. And it's 
and it's best done if there's a good play the ball on play two. So do you remember I was talking earlier about the the importance of the good rook for yeah. the hooker? Well, this is really important too with this set. And the other thing is the seven and the six can play close to or away from the line or put on plays. There's literally a lot of freedom there. Now, I'm going to go um, back to the website to show you the video to marry up on that. So I know I've I've stopped the share. So I'll go back. Can you now see a video? Yeah. Okay. Um, I'll mute it so that there's no sounds that we don't we don't like. Now the first clip you'll see it's almost I'd say it's almost perfect. So the first carry has gone near so it was a tap penalty and the first carry has just been a prop just hitting the ball up. The prop was about 82 years old then so oh sorry it's the second row I think it's a prop next. Yes this is a prop he's the 82 year old prop <laughs> Mark. He's got it now on a scrum line. The ball's on a scrum line Okay, now from this scrum line, and it will make sense when you see the next set afterwards, we could do what we want from here. We can sneak down a short side if we want. We can do the plus one set that I've just showed you on the diagram, or we could shift the ball to the other side. And soon I'll show you I'll show you when we do exactly that. The key thing is the opposition don't know what we're doing next, all right? Because we've got field balance. We're moving off the ball. We are... We are shouting and talking to the to the to the ball carriers on both sides of the ball so the defense are on the heels now based on the diagram this should now make sense this is the number seven and he should have some bodies around them around him so he's just done a normal catch pass you're happy that equates to what you've just seen on the on the graphic yeah 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 and now number six is is off the ball now he's organizing something Fullbacks hovering behind him, and they've just done a block play. So that's that set in action. Now, after you've done that, what you are looking for is a, a defensive line that's a bit all over the place. I've put this clip in as well because you can actually shortcut this and do it in one play rather than two, and this is an example of it. So the scoop was quite wide, so it went to the middle of the of the of the field um plus one and we've got to the opposite scrum line already so we've actually moved the opposition across the field already so we don't need to keep going or else we'll be in the hot dog stand so we've done the lateral wrap already so if your players get there quicker then just keep going with it does that make sense it doesn't have to be doesn't have to be two plays if you can get there in one is what I'm yeah, saying yeah yeah but it is important that your halves touch the ball so that they hold the defenders up. Now, because, because we've done that, these defenders here have had to work laterally. So we are now probing those. And can you already see their defensive line? A couple of players are hanging back. They've lost some defensive shape here. So there's plenty for us to probe. Mm -hmm. And that's because we've moved them across. Probably wasn't the best play from us, to be fair. To, but if you look at the game, it's actually early in the games, so they probably weren't taking too many risks. And then now he's just probed back inside because he's noticed that we're a bit lazy. And how we didn't get a penalty for that, I don't know. You'd get banned for about 10 weeks for that now, wouldn't you? But can you just see the work that the opposition have had to do in defence, working across the field? And then this is a schoolboy side doing... Basically the same thing. So the depth, the depth is quite an issue there. I would have liked it to have been a bit flatter, but um, there's different things that impact that. Sometimes, like from a tap penalty, you play the, the game. You play the game that fast, and you want to play the game that fast. The players haven't got time to get up there to get flat. <laughs> so, so they're a bit flatter here. Now, the other thing from this play, if you do it well. Once you've reached the middle of the field on your first plus one, if you're up, if your team counts defenders, there's one, two, three, four here. So the team in Marone have actually actually overread this and slid too far across. So do you agree with me? They should have gone back to the. They should have attacked back to the north sign, basically. Yeah, 
Yeah. Because there's less defenders there. So, yep. so that's the beauty of this set because it makes the defenders make a decision. And I have acknowledged that they've done the they've made they've made the wrong decision there. But even so, poor defensive teams will really overload because they've had to slide. So I think we've got most of the opposition from the post to the touchline here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And I might be wrong, there might be another out there too. So can you see how powerful that set is when it's done well? Yeah. Yeah. Because we've literally pulled the defence from from side to side. And now they'll look for a potentially tired or disoriented defender. And see what's knocking around. Again, they've had to do more work, the defence. And all the players are doing is looking up, seeing who's tired, seeing who's fallen out the line. And we find something back on the inside that leads to a try. This is another example of it, of it done quite well. And at pace, very good set to do when you've got good rooks, when you're, you're getting over the top of players. So the defence is it worked over laterally. All these players know they might have to defend something soon on the open side. So you're testing every defender in the line. You're giving them all a bit of work to do. So no defenders can have a snooze. And it also helps if you've got somebody really fast like this who can just run around a lazy defender and score under the sticks for you. But but it's um it's a really powerful set to 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 move opposition around the field. Now I want you to look at this set where they made the right decision in the middle of the field and went back to where things had gone. Just sorry it's an old video, so the, the quality is a bit a bit lower on this video, but can you still see it clearly? Yeah, clear enough. You do you do you do accept this is rugby league, not a different sport that you're watching on <laughs> it's still it's clear enough to tell it's rugby league. So there's the there's the plus one, but it goes really well. That's Adam Elliott who plays for the Knights now. And he's gone really well on that. So if you look at the red and white defenders, they're clearly not not lined up at the top of the field. So we go back at them. <clears throat> and you can literally do that time after time after time. And the opposition will never know which way you're going. Does that make sense to you that set, or do you want do you want any more explanation? Or no, that's good. No, no, that's no good. I would say well. I, I would say at both your age groups, that will be a pearler of a set for you to do. Do you do something yeah. similar to that already? Uh, we haven't had anything organised yet, but um, I think my boys will be capable of of doing that one. So. The um, it, 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 with you, Bill, the fact that you've got to go to your uh, first receiver a lot. If you can nail that, it, yeah, that we, that'll be perfect we, uh, for the rules. We do the first two, basically first receiver and one or plus one set, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then we got a play we call butter. So we spread the ball, yeah, because that's what you do with yeah. butter. So yeah. um, we spread it. <laughs> to open side and spread it back to the other open side and that pulls the yep. defence apart. And so yep. the last play we've got like numbers stacked up on one side. So I guess I guess the key to coaching good tactical rugby league is to set the defence up somewhere so you can attack them where they're weak. So if you were boxing, you'd punch a boxer in the abdomen so that he defends his abdomen so he can then go to his chin. Right, you wouldn't just go straight for his chin if that's his weak point, right? Because then he'd, he'd have the dukes up. It's the same in rugby league. You've got to take the defense somewhere they don't want to be, or make them work more than they want to work, and then expose where they're weak. And you can do that within a set, or you can do that within three, four, five, six sets. So, whenever I've had a real small team against a big team. I will do that set you've just son, done. You've just seen for eighty percent of the game to run the opposition tired, to make them ragged, and points come in the last ten minutes of the game for us. <laughs> you know, because we've just solidly stayed on that journey of of moving them around, and 
that's what you can that's how you can build pressure on an opposition. And what's really big on that as well is it makes the props defend. And it's not running directly at them. And <clears throat> if you send your props into the opposition props just in a straight shootout, not only do you tire out the defensive prop, you tire out your own prop too because he's going straight into the lion's den. Better to send him there with some support. Better to send him there on better terms so that he can dominate his opposite number when his opposite number's not in a comfortable position. Does does that make sense? Yeah. So, so it's a, it's a real good way of getting your forwards into the game and mobilising your forwards and also making it tougher for their forwards. Now, when I click on this diagram, and hopefully you see the diagram straight away, can you see the diagram? Yep. Yep. Beautiful. Now, forget the arrows and forget the the area of attack. Has anything changed in those numbers on the field compared to what you saw on the last one? Uh, just the fullback. He had a bit wider, is he? That's right. That's right. Yeah. So your fullback will tend to go where he thinks the, the attack's going to end up. And you could watch an NRL game and you can tell where the play is going to end up because the fullback tends to go there. Right? And the way to hide it is to get your lock to play a similar role too. So it's either the lock or the, or the one who do it or just to vary it. But ultimately now, that where the players are is exactly the same. So... Based on what you've just seen on video and now this diagram, can you tell me what you think this is this this will look like on the video? Um that'll be just a shift from one scrum line across to the opposite yeah. sideline, will it? That's right, yeah, absolutely. And Jumbra said earlier about set plays and how how it can you can you can make it really simple, like amazingly simple, but it can look complicated. And all you've got is three, two or three set plays. Could the nine, the nine can do a straight pass to the seven? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Could he do a block play if he wanted? Yep. Could he do a face ball if he wanted? Yes. All those options are there. All those options. Could the seven do the same before the ball gets to the six? He could. The six do the same before the ball gets to any one of these, probably the fullback. Yep. Right? So instead of having a line shot that has a certain set player on the end and that's one play, I always try and give the players the license to do what they want in each part of those areas. Does that make sense? So imagine, imagine we did a face ball from nine to seven, a block from seven to six, and a dummy inside for a block six to the outside. That would look like quite a complicated line shot, wouldn't it? It would look like the the Harlem Globetrotters. So that's what I'm talking about with you, your rules being simple. Uh, your, your, your playing rules being simple, I should say. I will get back to the to the video so you can see it in video. Every time I click off the um the PDF, it takes me out of screen share. It's a little work. I'm back on the website, boys. Yes, yep. Okay. So the key thing is the shape and where the players are stood is exactly the same as the set as the set you've just seen, right? And the components of it will it'll look exactly the same and and this is why the defense don't pick it up until it's too late quite often. So we've gone to a scrum line again. Obviously, we're on the other side of the field to what you've just seen. Did you see that decoy run there from the prop? The six has got the ball now, and instead of doing a short pass, he's passed straight to the other set, the other half, number seven. So they've cut out the middlemen now, and they've gone to seven, and then seven's done the business out there, and they've managed to to find a gap and score. Now. Rarely do you get to just shift and score, but I'm telling you now, if you can play to edges, 
in 12s and 14s, you will score a lot more tries because too many teams don't look at the edges. Um, so scrum line, shift to the other side of the field as quick as you can. I'm trying to remember this team. I think I told them to get deeper for for a reason. That the I can't remember what the reason was, but I did because I'm I'm a coach who likes it quite flat normally. Um, once you've shifted, that see how more, how how much quicker the defenders are moving now because we're shifting the ball. So shifting gets players going laterally, and look how they're over sliding, and because they're panicking. So moving the ball panics defenders. And if you can get your team to be nice and spread out on the field when they're attacking and get the ball doing the work, you will score a lot more tries because that if they stand in the right places, they'll see, they'll see where the space is. Do you see the, the connection with the last set in that this number seven here could hit this man if he wanted? Yeah. You're right. So they're exactly they're in exactly the same shape. They're just doing a different play within that shape. So this will be a good video to compare to the one you saw before because it's it's from the same side. So you remember Big Norbert carried the ball before. And now it goes seven. Seven will miss out the 10. So before he hit the 10, if you remember, now he's, he's missing out the 10 to hit the six, who misses out the second rower. And they're just getting the ball to the edges straight away. And have you noticed in all the opposition videos, oh, sorry, the opposition defences, they're over, they're over, they're over sliding. They're they're overcompensating for the shifting ball. This is a bit of a lower talented squad. This because uh, this was a game that we thought we thought we'd win. So we give some of the the players who weren't playing much a game in this. But even them doing it could still stretch the opposition. And at 12s and 14s, if you can nail this, you're going to have so much success. And this is quite a poorly executed set, but we're still creating problems in the defensive line because they're panicking. They don't know where we're going next, you see. And it's just that concept of shifting the ball, getting to the edges, and then you can use the front man a bit later when they're over sliding. So it's like a... Um, if you if you keep pushing the ball wide, they're going to think you're going to keep pushing it wide, and when they over overstretch, you just pass the short. You just pass a short ball. Um, are you keeping up with me, boys? With this? Yeah, yeah, yep. yep. And this is a Super League game not so long ago. Watch this. So this is how powerful the shift can be. There's the ball there. This is the top level in England. So that ball, he's engaged that defender. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine defenders are out of the picture. Nine of the defender nine of the defenders are tied up. And imagine he'd have shifted here rather than kicking the ball. Look at the overlap here. So our play a lot of our players are conditioned to try and play through defensive lines a lot rather than around them. And that's Super League. That was Super League. So if you can encourage your players to look up and see what's around them. And of course, some teams as well put their weaker players out on, on, a, on an edge defensively anyway. You cool with that? Yep. Um, the exit set, right, is a very, 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 very simple set. It is literally scoot, scoots and hit ups around the rook, right? So, but you still keep that that attacking shape, so that they think you're doing the other sets. What I do with my exit sets is I tend not to send the team down the middle. I try and probe the scrum lines and go to the middle with my fast men a bit later on. What do you guys do with your teams when you're exiting? Uh, 
just attack the one side generally. Yeah. Like, yeah, pretty much same attack down the scrum line. Yeah. Bill? Uh, I get my first receiver to take the first run up and try and get quick play the ball, get the dummy half to scoot off that. And usually that gets them to the 20 meter line. And yeah. Then we replay off that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So have you noticed most teams do quite similar things? Yeah. Yeah. It's, when you're in your own half, you take, basically just want to get out of it, don't you? <laughs> you want to get the ball to the other end of the field. So um, what you'd be seeing in these videos was just tar targeting scrum line. How are you guys doing defensively with your teams? Uh, my boys are getting there. Um, some are definitely a lot better defenders than others at the moment. So, mm -hmm. Bill? so hopefully by the time May comes around, we'll, we'll all be at a decent level defensively, hopefully. Okay. What are you finding, Bill? Um, yeah, our guys are sliding a bit too hard and we're leaving people isolated in the middle of the field at the moment. Okay. We'll have a dummy half defending five kids in the middle and the edge will be standing out on the edge. So, yeah, it's not great. But okay. that's something to work on this week. Yeah, all right. Um, without, yeah, without, without seeing your defence, it's a bit hard to to suggest something. But... You've both suggested that there's players that struggle with tackling, yeah? Yeah, definitely. Okay. Yeah, definitely. I'm huge, 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 huge. You see on you see on these here, I've got effort one, the hit, and then effort two, after the hit, rook control. I'm huge on the fact that you can't have the effort two bit without the effort one bit. So if you don't do the tackle right, your rook control is going to be a lot harder. Does that make sense? Yeah, we're and... really focusing on effort one at the moment, so. Yeah, okay. And as I said, in the commentary today, they referred to how Manly are, have gone back hugely to to tackling rather than, um, you know, cuddling the player kind of thing. So... This team here were a lot of older men with some old habits, but I was very successful, and, and I've done this a lot before, in getting them to just think about tackling with the shoulder, the top of the shoulder, right? And getting a bit lower. Now, this isn't the lowest of lows, but you'll see the thinking about it, and you'll see that the legs are bent, and they're trying to keep the studs in the ground, and that's what I call shoulder contact, S-shaped body, keeping the studs in the ground, right? Because that helps you with all your rook control efforts afterwards. So I am completely stress, uh, stressing on this video that these guys aren't perfect at it. There's some better there's some better clips coming up. But, again, this is something that you'll be able to turn around quickly with your teams. Can you see this player is making an effort to bend his legs, keep his studs in the ground, and put his shoulder in somewhere? And... It really helps with your rook control uh, efforts after. So you've you, you know you're both saying you're not doing much wrestling, but I, 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 would you class that as wrestling? What we've just seen, or would you class it as a player just finishing his tackle off? Just finishing the tackle off. That's right. That's right. And that that also gives an indication to the ref that you're just tackling. You're not wrestling, right? So aim for shoulder contact, top of the shoulder. S-shaped body keeping your studs in the ground. And it helps you to control rooks in and around after. So this is why I'm so big on there not being rook control or rook control not being easy without that SSS, shoulder contact, S-shaped body, studs in the ground. So I can promise you in this game, I was telling the players to get the shoulders in more. And as the game went on, it, they got better at it again. And it allows you to get that purchase when you're trying to control control the defenders afterwards and it, it literally is just a tackle but we are killing the rook as well so we're getting good rook speeds defensively despite not really doing loads of wrestling we're just tackling and again particularly in light of what's happening with litigation 
around tackling and whatnot, I can promise you this method of tackling has still not been outlawed in the Super League where you literally can't go near the head in any way, shape or form. Now, I'm just trying to pause this one because that is a perfect example of it in many ways. His feet are a little bit far away, but this this tackle has gone has gone out of the top game quite significantly and another reason why we shouldn't copycat Blanche what we see in the NRL. But look how effective this kind of tackle is when you get in under the ball, shoulder contact in under the ball and literally just hammer someone into the ground. Uh, let me go a bit further because that video probably isn't quite relevant to what I'm trying to show now. Or is it? Yeah, it is actually. Give me one sec. Okay. How clear is this video, boys, for you? Um, yeah, it's all right. It's pretty good. All right. We can make it a game. <sighs> can you make out that's James Graham when he was 18? <laughs> okay. That is That was James Graham when he was 18. It's England Academy versus Australia. And that's Greg Inglis there. Um, you see how they're going a bit chesty and getting knocked back in that tackle? They're not really using the shoulders? Yeah. So Australia have got out quite easily. Was that chesty? Mm, very. Soon the kicker will get the ball. He'll have no pressure on him at all because England are going backwards. So gets the kick away. Australia make 90 metres. The ten, the ten meters away from the try line. By the time the kick gets returned, now with shoulder shaped studs. So Australia are starting on the twenty meter line, but look at the difference now. They put the shoulders in. They have an element of rook control afterwards, but it does it look like wrestling? I don't think it does. It just looks like they're trying to get a guy to the ground. But instead, now they're putting the shoulders in, or at least the chest is dominant. This is a very good example of it. The first collision, the second collision, isn't quite as good. But and now look at the trouble they have getting the kick away. Now the defense is right on top of the kicker, and he had to kick the ball high, so the meters haven't they're not made as many meters. You see the difference in those two sets defensively. Yeah, huge difference. Huge difference. Now, that was the same game. <laughs> it wasn't three weeks later. It was the same game, and it just the change of tackle technique. It can have a real impact. So, especially at your ages, uh, if, you can, if you can focus on the effort one more, the effort two will really come with it. How are you both with ABCs and markers and things like that? Um, I haven't done a lot of work with my boys just yet. On um, that's coming up. So, yeah, we did a little bit last year, but like it's obviously going to be a bit more of focus this year. Mm-hmm. That's that's my that's my system there. So, first marker hold, second marker fold in the direction of the ball, and the fold is literally one step. Um, and A B C defenders on each side of the rope, nice and tight. And everyone gets up quick there to recreate the defensive wall. So we'll get to the video in a minute. So I put a huge emphasis on recreating the wall around the rook. Because what I want is I want the defenders to be in such a good position that the opposition know that they shouldn't come down in behind the rook. Right? So that opens their bodies up when they run. It means you can whack them easier. So they have to step out. Again, not perfect from my team. You know, don't get me wrong. But if there was space inside, he would have stepped inside. Now, this is how this is how clued up and how we emphasize this. You'll notice in this clip now, they actually, one of them gets it wrong. So this fella here is in no man's land. He's actually behind the markers. So he shouted to this marker so he could just slide into the wall again. You see that? You pick that up? 
Yeah. So he should is, he yeah. should he shouldn't be there. He should be out here. So he just told the marker to go further. That marker's in the right position there now, but he actually tells him to go further and he tells him to go back, back into the line. See how the see how the wall's just been recreated? And that's the goal. That's the goal I always try and get from, from ABC and marker. Because a lot of forwards try and target him behind the rook. So if you can recreate that wall, it forces the opposition forwards and scoots to run overs lines, which are easier to control. So if you imagine you've got shoulder-shaped studs on the back of that, you're going to have really good control in defence. So... Again, I, I spoke earlier about really, really, really um, simplifying rugby league coaching and making everything sound really simple. I literally, my marker system is to help recreate a defensive wall. Um, slide defense here. My big, my big tip. And this is a golden rule, basically. Tell your players not to slide until the ball has the ball has gone past them. All right. Um, any other questions about any of that? Because we can we can pick up next week from where we were anyway. Because we've done about an hour and twenty now, and I always try and leave a bit of time to to talk about anything. Or um, no, that's been pretty good. But you're right. Mm-hmm. A lot of young guys, a lot of kids will tend to overslide before the ball right. gets to them. So, yeah. So next week we'll talk a little bit more about the the core skill of of grip, pass, catch, carry as well, but only a little bit. I've even got a ball. I brought a ball with me for this one, but I think we we went a bit further with the tactical stuff today. So, um. And also have a think between now and next week, boys, if you want to go into any more detail about what we've discussed already. Um, the other things we've got to go through in the coming week, in, in, the, in, in, in the coming session next week, will be the why of what we're doing and, and how, how you can put it into your training, the structure of your training. Because a lot of the work I do with coaches, they, they have really good activities and do really good sessions, but then I really maximise the learning of their players. So... Um, yeah, it might. I'm just thinking that where we've just got to there might be a really good place to to finish the formal stuff today for next week, so that so that we, we we don't do too much of one thing this week and don't leave enough for next week. Any questions, Bill, or any thoughts? Ah, uh, no, mate. I just I've got a lot of really experienced kids that have played like seven or eight seasons, and I've got some that have just come in. So I'm just trying to balance the session to meet both their needs yeah okay um if you two want to send me your session plan so i can have a look at them for you don't hesitate right yep sounds you know, good if you just you know if you just want to run and buy someone jason and you know yeah. yep now that sounds good but I've, I've been pretty much using uh your yours um the last couple of sessions anyway so and i'll yeah, keep cool. using those cool. for a bit longer as well so they well, seem you know, to just, enjoy just them. just pick up the phone just i'm thinking of doing this lee what do you reckon you know it's not a problem it's not a problem so um yeah that's that's the whole idea of it so um so next week we'll go through a bit more things to coach please have a think if there's anything more that you want to go in there i, I do want to stress the simplicity of it though but next week we'll talk a bit more about the delivery of it, okay, and how you deliver the message and how you deliver and get the learning out of the players. All right? Yeah, now that'll be good. Now, I do I do say about 90 minutes to the session. We've done about we've done about um 82. So is that, is that all right if we do it if we <laughs> call it a day here and then um because if obviously if we had 40 on there might be a few more questions, so um, nah, that's the, all good, mate. All good. Because they, they'll, yeah, these will only right, get mate. busier. They, these will only get busier anyway. I think so. Um, I'll send you the record in the next twenty-four hours. Okay. Awesome. Thanks, mate. Thank you. Take care, boys. Right. Thanks for joining. Thanks very See much. Ya. See you. See you next Take week, care. mate.
See ya.